Okay, finally we'll talk about how the Denur Nassim attack can be used in practice and how it's actually a realizable attack. Um, it's not just purely for theory, though it was very influential there as well. And fortunately, there's a very nice case study uh, which illustrates how effective it can be, uh, which was in 2017. In particular, uh, a company named Aircloak, they released a production system named Diffix. And the goal of Diffix was to provide data analysts the ability to provide to perform an unlimited number of queries on a sensitive database. So immediately your alarm bell should be going off because remember we were saying that uh, if, a, an, if the analyst can perform just n queries or even two to the n queries, then they can reconstruct uh, the database. So here they're saying you're allowed to do uh, unlimited number of queries. That seems to be pretty bad immediately. Like this should be very vulnerable to attack. Uh, and at the same time, they want to pre preserve user privacy, but add even less noise than what differential privacy would necessitate. So somehow they want to get more and do even less. So this kind of seems too good to be true. Uh, and I guess the skipping a bit to the punchline, uh, it was too good to be true, as demonstrated by researchers uh, Cohen and uh, Nassim, same Nassim as before, in sort of a paper that was released this year. Uh, it was too good to be true. But essentially, like uh, let's just taking a step back a bit, in 2017, they uh, released a challenge known as the Air Cloak Challenge, essentially saying, uh, it, this was essentially the first bounty program for anonymized data re-identification, and they said if anyone can perform an ident a re-identification attack in this setting, then uh, they'll award cash prizes as large as, say, like $5,000 or something. So naturally, this attracted the attention of uh, many researchers in this area, saying, like, uh, you know, you're somehow trying to promise better guarantees than what differential privacy can, whereas we already know I sort of alluded to the fact that it's kind of tight. Uh, so, okay, we haven't talked about differential privacy, so let's just compare it with what we know. Uh, we know, you know, these attacks uh, that we talked about before, so let's talk about the differences in setting uh, compared to what we've uh, already studied. So this the similarity, I guess, like still, uh, you know, we have subset or count queries. This is unchanged. But uh, the main difference is the fact that the magnitude of noise, so sort of the size of E, is proportional to the square root of the number of conditions. And what do I mean by that? Uh, let's, let's take a step way back. Uh, remember we had something at the beginning of this lecture where uh, we had uh, say name equals Alice or Bob or Eve. Well, this would be one, two, three conditions. So to this type of query, you would add a uh, square root of the number of conditions. So yeah, this kind of says that uh, if if you 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 add Kind of if you add fewer conditions then if you have fewer conditions sort of perhaps specifying a set kind of uh, coarsely then you add uh, less noise and if you have a lot of uh, uh, conditions trying to specify a set very finely then it'll add more noise uh, so this is sort of a not specifying too much so there's other heuristics which have been uh, baked into this as well uh, in order to also prevent uh, disclosure for example, uh, one other thing is they say uh, no or statements. So for example, this uh, uh, example I gave here, which has ors, this would not be allowed because they forbid or statements. Um, yeah, there's also say suppression of small counts, modification of extreme values. Uh, but yeah, none of this is really too important. The key thing we're going to focus on is the fact that uh, the uh, s amount of noise that you add is proportional to the square root of the number of conditions. And sort of secondarily will be this sort of specification here um, that you're not allowed or statements. So 
why does this, uh, I claim we're going to have to modify the attack. Why are we going to have to modify the attack? Let's take a step way back to the beginning of this lecture, or I guess earlier in the second part, where we talked about the fact that how would we specify a subset? I sort of said for now, we're just going to say, okay, you use a big or statement and you specify exactly the things you want. Well, now, like I said, this is no longer possible because of the fact that uh, diffx specifically forbids this or construction. So we have to pick another way to uh, specify these sets. In particular, let's, let's uh, recall the denur Nassim attack, the efficient one that uh, we sort of just talked about in the last part uh, of last segment. It relies really on picking random sets. The goal is to be able to pick large random sets, but the, there's sort of two challenges behind doing this. The first challenge is the fact that, you know, we're not allowed uh, or statements, so there's challenge one. Uh, if, we could just do, if we could do or statements, then it would be perhaps not too bad to do something like this, but uh, those are not allowed. But like I said, the second and more important challenge is the fact that uh, we have the noise growing as the number of conditions. So what we're going to want is some way of specifying large random sets while simultaneously not introducing a lot of conditions. If we put in too many conditions, it'll be an immense amount of noise. And so is there some way we can sort of specify large uniform subsets without doing it in this way? And Cohen and Nassim uh, are the ones who came up with a way of doing this, which is somewhat heuristic in nature, but uh, it turned out to be surprisingly effective. And they kind of did it by turning the sort of way that we did it before uh, on its head. The way that uh, the denur Nassim attack, how we conceptualized it was a sort of two-step process. The first step is to pick a random set. And the second step is to generate a query to specify uh, that random set that we chose. On the other hand, the way Cohen and Nassim did it is they just chose a random set of conditions. Uh, they, they sort of specify a random condition, which will uh, specify a random set as a result. And it turns out that these random sets that they imply will be uh, sufficiently random for our purposes in order to execute this attack. In particular, the type of random queries will have low number of conditions. Uh, recall that uh, you know we want as few possible conditions as we can get. And so, uh, if they specify a low number of conditions, then maybe we can trick or even fool diffx into adding much less noise than would be needed under, say, differential privacy or any other sort of privacy-preserving method. So, okay, the way they did this is the following. They, they used, uh, this might get a little bit technical and a kind of weird and like a little bit wonky, but bear with me. They used a kind of hashing style uh, attack. So let's let's uh, specify a bit more about uh, the data set, what, it, what the data set looked like that they worked on. The, each thing had an ID, which uh, was specified as like, let's just say client ID. And the hashing type approach that they did was the following. They ask, uh, they, they wanted to take a function that takes in a client ID and outputs a, a sort of bit which is as close to being one half as possible. And I mean this in a sort of non-rigorous way. Uh, I mean, you know, heuristically, does it seem like this type of function will be equally likely to include a client ID in it or not? And so they specify the set of functions that they use for hashing in the following way. So they have uh, four things. So they have, say, malt x d, and pred. So these are the four uh, parameters which are going to specify a function. And by varying these parameters, then you can specify different functions, which might be useful for um, getting different queries. So these, are, these three are numbers. And this is a sort of a true false question. So let, let me try to precisely say what type of uh, queries that uh, Cohen and Nassim used. They said a row, that is a client ID, would be included in the query 
if it satisfies the following condition, and I'll write this out explicitly, and then we can discuss it. All right, so this is a bit weird, but uh, let, me, let me try to parse it for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the client ID. We will multiply it by this uh, one of our parameters, malt. We will raise this to the power exp. And we're going to look at the dth digit of that expansion and see if it satisfies some uh, predicate, which is a true-false question. So let's, uh, let's, let's do an example. So suppose uh, malt equals 1. Uh, sorry, multi equals say 17, client ID equals 1, exp equals 0 0.5, d is equal to 3, and cred is equal to the following question asking, uh, is the digit even? Okay, so in this instance, let's try to see what this is. So we're going to first compute malt times client ID to the exp. So that means we take 17 times one to the 0 0.5. This is equal to 4.1231 dot, dot, dot. Now what we're going to do is take a look at the uh, third decimal place here, or the, sorry, the third uh, digit. So one, two, three. And we're going to see, is it even or not? And we can see that uh, it is even. So the answer to this uh, query would be yes. So just to repeat, uh, if, the query, if the query you do is specified by these parameters and it's run on client ID equal to one, then the answer will be yes, and it will be included in the set. Uh, this, will, this will be sort of one of the things that we query. So this might seem a little bit ad hoc and a little bit weird, a little bit heuristic, and the answer to all of those is yes, it is. Uh, but it seems to work surprisingly well. So let me write this as uh, equal code. Um, this is sort of from the paper of Cohen and Nassim. And you can see it looks, uh, I'll, I'll try to parse this. We're not going to need the full, uh, to fully understand what SQL does. But it says, you know, count how many uh, are in the subset. And this is the table from loans. Uh, the loan status C is kind of the sensitive bit that we're trying to say. Client ID between 2,000 and 3,000 is, uh, is the one that we're, this is sort of the range that we're trying to look at. So ignore these, but the main way that we specify the subset is just using this kind of arcane looking expression here. And this arcane expression is essentially uh, a query kind of like we did here uh, of a slightly different form. Maybe take a close look at this and see if you can find out what the parameters are and figure out how this one works. But the point is that, uh, what, what did we do here? We managed to come up with some way of specifying a subset with only one additional uh, condition. Remember that uh, before we would have had a method which was like maybe n over two conditions in order to specify it if we have a random uh, subset. So we came up with a very, very succinct way um, based on what the client IDs were, which seemed to uh, map things to zero or one with fairly with with good enough probabilities such that it was possible to execute this attack. So how effective was this? Well, uh, this is more blatantly non-private than blatant non-privacy. They were able to reconstruct a hundred percent of the private information. And let's think about why. Remember the fact that uh, you know I said we could add square root n noise, uh, and that's sort of when uh, the attack started breaking down. Uh, if you performed n queries with a square root n noise. But here, in this case, we added much less than square root n noise. We added just O of 1 noise, like just one additional query. So there's like almost no noise uh, on these uh, queries. And so it's very easy to uh, reconstruct based on the estimates. It's easy to find something which is consistent with them. So they essentially use the exact same uh, attack as this Dinur and Asim attack. Maybe a few changes, such as uh, the ones which I mentioned uh, in the uh, 
in the that which appeared in this Dwork uh, McSherry Talwar paper, which allows some uh, noisings to be unbounded. But essentially, uh, this allow they managed to crack it, and you know, Diffix uh, had to be taken back to the drawing board. Aircloak went and revised it, and they have recently announced a uh, new challenge, which kind of patches this type of attack by disallowing these crazy type of arithmetic operations. So it remains to be seen whether this uh, this new uh, system is attackable. Uh, stay tuned, and I'm sure we'll see you soon. So that's it for today's uh, lecture on uh, reconstruction attacks. Uh, next time, we'll actually show how we can sort of fight against uh, reconstruction attacks or attacks in general with the introduction of differential privacy. Thanks for joining today.